Good afternoon. My name's Glenn Davis, and it's a delight to welcome you this evening to the University of Melbourne for an important lecture from our esteemed visitor, Lord Justice Brian Levison. Before we begin, let me start in our traditional way by acknowledging the owners of the land on whom we, whom we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and on behalf of the university, pay respects to elders past and present. Lord Justice Levison comes to us fresh from an inquiry in the United Kingdom considering the ethics and culture of the media and the thorny question of recognising the requirements of free speech with the challenges of accountability for journalism. And in this evening's forum, Sir Brian will not be discussing the specifics of the Levinson Inquiry, nor its resulting report and recommendations, but rather the theme for his speech is on news gathering in a time of change, highly opposite for our times. Many observers see journalism as being in a state of flux, and uncertainty over the media's future holds significant implications for the future of our democracy. Conscious of these pressing concerns, the University of Melbourne has been proud to host the work of the organiser for this evening's lecture, the Centre for Advanced Journalism, led by Professor Margaret Simons. The Centre exists to make a contribution to a positive future for journalism through teaching the next generation of journalists through research and not least through events like tonight's lecture, public conversations about the present and future of media practice, which seek to engage people who will make a difference to the future of journalism. And that, of course, means not just journalists, but importantly, their audiences, the citizens. Regulation and self-regulation of the news media, and as we've seen over the past few days of the media more broadly, have been an important issue here and in the United Kingdom. In this country, we've seen the federal government's independent inquiry into media regulation, but also the Convergence Review, which examined the frameworks applying to a converging media and communications landscape. The Centre for Advanced Journalism at the University of Melbourne has been proud to host a series of debates and events around these reports and their recommendations. And here, as in elsewhere, these events always show up the diversity of views about the reports and what they propose, how media should be regulated, what the role of public interest is. These are clearly hugely critical debates for us. They invite a public scrutiny of its own and a university is an ideal place to take on these issues. How do we protect the vital role that journalists have in a liberal democracy and at the same time hold them to account for how they do their work? In that most ancient of questions, quies custodiat, Epsos Custodiet, who guards the guardians, who should decide whether the public interest in a story justifies the methods used to obtain that information. What constructive role do journalists play in an increasingly media-enabled world? These are vital questions, and we're delighted tonight to be able to welcome Lord Justice Levinson to contribute his thoughts. And if you're inclined to contribute yours as he goes, try hashtag Levinson2012 but uh, by way of introduction. Lord, uh, Sir Brian Levison is a Lord Justice of Appeal in England and Wales. He was appointed a Knight Bachelor in 2000 and sworn in as a Privy Councillor in 2006. He's also Chairman of the University College School Council in London. Since 2009, he's chaired the United Kingdom's Sentencing Council, which aims to promote transparency and consistency in sentencing while maintaining the independence of the judiciary. In July 2011, it was announced that he would lead the public inquiry into the culture, practice and ethos of, and ethics of the press, uh, raised, of course, by the News International phone hacking scandal. Hearings began in November 2011 and the full report was published just last month. So fresh from that mammoth task, we are delighted to welcome tonight to speak on Hold the Front Page, News Gathering in a Time of Change, please welcome Lord Justice Brian Levinson. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a real privilege to have been asked to give this public lecture and, echoing the Vice-Chancellor, I am pleased to acknowledge that we're standing on the land of the Wurundjeri people, a 
and to pay respect to their elders and families, past and present. I would also like to thank the Centre for Advanced Journalism at the University of Melbourne for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I hope you will forgive me for providing some context to what I'm about to say. As you're aware, I've spent the past 17 months engaged in an inquiry into the culture, practices and ethics of the press. The report was published nearly a fortnight ago on the 29th of November and, as I've said before, it may be that some of you are hoping that I will elaborate. If you are, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. When I launched the report, which must be read in the context of the terms of reference for the inquiry, I said this. I believe that the report can and must speak for itself. To that end, I will be making no further comment. Nobody will be speaking for me about its contents, either now or in the future. The reason is very simple. I treat the report as a judgment, and judges simply do not enter into discussion about judgments that they've given. They don't respond to comment, however misconceived. Neither do they seek to correct error. The judgment, or in this case, the report, has to speak for itself. I am entirely content that it does. That doesn't mean that I can't talk about the law. It's common for judges to give lectures or make speeches about areas of the law within their expertise or issues of legal public concern, provided only that they do not touch upon their own decisions or others which might fall to them for determination. So, what do I intend to speak about? The title of tonight's lecture is suggestive, at least, of two things. First, at the present time, news gathering is taking place against a changing, if not a rapidly and dramatically changing, background. I refer, of course, to the Internet, and will focus initially on some aspects of that development. But there is another, more well-established background to news gathering, which is often misunderstood, and which provides incentives for journalists as we recognise them to be, but which also has its own limitations, which must be understood and addressed. In one word, that is the law, and the place that the law occupies in relation to story gathering and reporting. As a result, I also intend to examine some of the issues to which the criminal and the civil law have given rise. So, the internet, a changing competitive background. The popular press has been in its present form more or less since the mid-19th century. It developed as a consequence of technological innovations which rendered printing less expensive. So much less expensive that newspapers could be sold for as little as a penny. Since that time, we've lived in a world dominated by the popular professional media, whether that is print or broadcast. It's how we learnt what was happening at a time, what was happening at both a national and international level. Initially newspapers, then radio, then television, all jostled for position as prime providers of news and information. But technology has made our world very different. First, there was the proliferation of television stations, with news being provided not just at 7 a.m. on the hour and then at 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. It's now provided 24-7, and newspapers are no longer the first to bring it to our attention. Secondly, and a cause of monumental change, has been the Internet. In particular, it has created a challenge to the print media unlike any form or type of competition which it has yet faced. As advertising migrates online with massive loss of revenue, this challenge is well understood. But there are other e extremely significant concerns 
not least relating to the way that we, as a society, keep up to date with the world around us and the extent to which we now seek content and opinion, all of which is expensive to obtain and process without paying anything for it. Recent events have brought this challenge into sharp relief. So, journals such as the Huffington Post are published only online. I struggled with the noun. Should they still be called newspapers? Further, as, you're well, as you may well be aware, Newsweek recently announced that it was to abandon its print edition. From this December, it is to become an internet-only publication. In Australia, Greg Highwood, the chief executive officer of Fairfax Media, the second largest newspaper publisher behind News Limited, has observed that the company is on a journey, moving from predominance in print to predominance in digital form. He has suggested that The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald might not exist in print form within three years. The change to the business model has led to the closure of a large number of local newspapers in the United Kingdom and the United States, with the consequent reduction in the extent to which local services, whether government, health, education or transport, can be held to account. When I started at the bar, there was a local reporter in every court. That is no longer the case. Society will be less well served as a result. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. The press is fighting back and great innovation has resulted. In an effort to extend reach and retain advertisers, some newspapers are now free. The Evening Standard in London and the MX newspaper here in Melbourne are examples. Furthermore, the press is more than able to convert from print to digital platforms. Some of the websites provided by the newspaper publishers are truly fantastic sources of information and comment, presented attractively with podcasts, interactive displays, ever-expanding content, not limited by the number of pages, and opportunity for reader feedback. This suggests that it is not going to be too long before a significant number of front pages will be electronic only. The problem of generating a monetary return, however, remains. How to pay for the journalism, the on-location reporting, the explanation and the comment, all from the brightest and best journalists of our time. One approach has been the creation of a paywall, which in the UK works for specialist papers such as the Financial Times, but by all accounts, and I'm not privy to secret information, is less successful for the news international title, The Times. In Australia, both the national dailies now have paywalls. Although I understand that the pricing model was adjusted last year, Fairfax Media has operated a paywall for some time for the Australian Financial Review and has said that it intends to introduce one next year for its metropolitan mastheads, <laughs> The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Late last year, the Australian newspaper, owned by News Limited, introduced a paywall. Meanwhile, this year, The Herald Sun, also owned by News Limited, became the first Australian metropolitan daily and the first tabloid to introduce a paywall. The success of this strategy remains to be seen, but, is but it is critical that the challenge of making the digital platform pay must be overcome. If the vital role that the press occupy is to be preserved, hard-won stories sometimes extremely expensive to research and frequently very much in the public interest, must be part of a commercially viable model. 
This issue is, however, only part of the problem. As I have said, newspapers trade in information and informed comment. Selling these commodities is important to their survival. The internet, on the other hand, generally does not trade. True, in Australia there are a number of small independent journals that publish only on the internet, take advertising and employ professional journalists. The best known will be Crikey, which was founded by a single journalist, Stephen Main, and is now owned by private media partners. Another well-known example is Business Spectator, founded by well-established, reputable financial journalists in partnership with Eric Beecher of private media partners and recently sold to News Limited. Then there's the magazine style, Mamma Mia, founded by journalist Mia Friedman, and the hoopla, founded by comedian and journalist Wendy Harmer, or the design files, founded by Lucy Feagans, which is giving the glossy, hard, cop hard copy lifestyle magazines a run for their money. There are other, less well-known examples serving specialist audiences, a number of which are now making a modest amount of money. Further, there are some bloggers who carry advertising and tweeters who are sponsored. In the main, however, online bloggers and tweeters are amateur reporters who do not sell anything. They simply publish online, convey on Facebook, upload onto YouTube, tweet or retweet. It's they who have become yet further competitors of the press adding to the competition that is so immediately and graphically provided by radio and television. Although potentially causing damage to the business model for the press, in more than one sense, blogging adds to free speech and is not necessarily a bad thing. Indeed, in his recent book, The Rise of the Fifth Estate, the former public servant Greg Jericho, who came to prominence entirely through his political commentary on the Grog's Gamut blog, asserts that the best bloggers provide comment and analysis every bit as good as that found in mainstream media, and in some cases, better. Please don't ask me to judge. He also argues that those active on social media act as watchdogs on the mainstream journalists, fact-checking, arguing, and calling to account in a fashion not possible only a very short while ago. The same can be said of the wider internet. Full organisations such as Full Fact in the United Kingdom exist to challenge the accuracy of press reporting and achieve considerable publicity through their websites. Although unregulated and therefore potentially dangerous, aspects of the internet are undeniably a force for good. The problem for the international community will be to harness the good and discourage or remove incentives from those that have been set up and exist deliberately to flout with impunity the rights of others. One reason for doing so was provided to the inquiry when it was asserted that, and I quote, privacy is for pedos. In the future, professional newspapers, magazines and journals both online and in print, will compete ever more directly with the blogger and the tweeter, whether good, bad or indifferent, whether accurate or fiction dressed as fact. In this environment, we're therefore likely to see both professional and amateur news gathering and comment operating solely or at least predominantly on the internet. I say predominantly because for my part, I have no doubt that we're likely to continue seeing newspapers in print along with print runs for specialist markets or purchases. The migration to the internet of the established media may yet be some time in the future. But as I've explained, it has started. And the growth of specialist online competitors to the established media will no doubt continue apace. We cannot, as Grant... Gilmore put it, simply in tone, as Blackstone would have exhorted, quotes, let us preserve unchanged 
the estate which we've been lucky enough to inherit. Let us avoid any attempt at reform. We don't have that luxury. We're going to have to give serious consideration to the changes that will result from these developments. But on the other hand, we must not go to the other extreme and discard what is important or of value in our attempt to react to events around us. We are, for instance, going to have to consider the role which the civil and criminal law play and how a changed environment affects the application and efficacy of the law. In this regard, I want to pose a question. It's one raised in another context by the United States constitutional scholar Philip Bobbitt in his book Terror and Consent. It strikes me, though, it is equally applicable to the question of how we are to ensure that it is equally applicable to the, the, how we are to assure that the legal framework, by which I mean the criminal and civil law, not the regulatory framework, operates in the background to any front page. The question can be summarised by asking whether we follow Blackstone or whether we follow that other great titan of the common law, Mansfield. The distinction Bobbitt draws between these two giants of our legal past is this. On the one hand, as I have observed, Blackstone was a champion of the status quo, a defender of the traditional inherited law. On the other hand, Mansfield, the founder of much of our common law, believed in developing the law in the light of actual practice, and in respect of commercial law, did so in order to reflect, quote, the international cosmopolitan character of the mercantile community. The question for us all will be what changes may or will become necessary to ensure that the criminal and the civil law remain effective. In considering that question, we may well have to consider what constitutes both the international and the cosmopolitan makeup of the internet. Focusing on these questions, it's essential to give due consideration to the law as it presently is. With that in mind, I want to spend some time looking at the nature of both the criminal and the civil law as it now operates. Having done so, I want briefly to consider the areas where what is required for the future may challenge or at least question what has worked hitherto. Here also I recognise that I add to the pressure on journalists. So the legal background, the criminal law. The criminal law can touch upon the work of journalists in many ways and inevitably prescribes the ways in which it is acceptable for stories to be obtained. Journalists, whether professional or amateur, whether in the print media or the online media, are subject to the same law as everyone else. How in practice does the criminal law operate? Like all laws, it is not self-effecting. It relies, in the ultimate analysis, on detection, investigation and notification. In the United Kingdom, as in Australia, crimes come to be notified to the police and investigated in a number of different ways. First, and most likely, is that a complaint of crime or possible crime is made to the police. The victim of, say, a burglary or a robbery will contact the police and report the matter. Equally plausible is that the police will be notified in the event that the victim of, say, a shooting attends hospital. Alternatively, the police might themselves either be called to the scene of a crime, whether by a victim or witness, or they might be present and witness events themselves, such as might occur during an occasion of public disorder. This report might be immediate and contemporaneous with events, it might follow after days, a burglary only detected when the householder returns from holiday, after weeks or months, a fraud, or maybe only after many years, historical sexual abuse. Whenever and however notified, if the police take up the complaint, they'll obtain statements from witnesses and pursue such investigations as they can. An inquiry might involve scenes of crime officers, forensic scientists or other experts. 
It might involve the collection of documentary or other real evidence. It might involve the pursuit of information from those who might know who is responsible. That's one way. Alternatively, for some criminal offences, and in particular for some of the most serious and those which do not generate victims likely to complain to the police, rather than wait for a possible victim, the police will target either an offence or a suspected offender. By way of example, large-scale supply of Class A drugs, heroin, may well be detected because of some intelligence leading to surveillance and the development of evidence in that way. Police resources may well be devoted to target a serious criminal activity without waiting for the crime to be committed. In this type of case, however, again, evidence will then be followed up, collated and researched in the same way. Whatever might have drawn the attention of the police, either to the crime or the alleged criminal, many of the same investigative techniques will be deployed in order to bring those guilty of crime before the courts. Thus, during the course of an investigation for an indictable offence, a search warrant or search warrants can be obtained in the United Kingdom, that's Section 8 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984. There are undeniably equivalent powers in Australia. The potential relevant evidence is then seized. Assuming reasonable grounds can be established for the commission of an indictable offence, a suspect may be arrested. And once lawfully on premises being searched, in the UK at any rate, the police can seize anything in plain view, which the officer has reasonable grounds for believing has been obtained in consequence of the commission of an offence to prevent it being lost, damaged, altered or destroyed, and anything which the officer has reasonable grounds for believing constitutes evidence in relation to an offence being investigated or any other offence. That's section 19 of the 1984 Act. This again is likely to be commonplace, although perhaps expressed in different terms. These searches may reveal further evidence. When it comes to journalistic material, however, in the UK, there are very important restrictions to these powers and limits on how far the police can go. This summary of the process is important. It underlines the vital significance of what constitutes the trigger for a police investigation. In the first case, it was the complaint of the victim or other knowledge that a crime had been committed. In the second, it was the intelligence or submission that crime was in train, thereby leading to a proactive investigation of the principal suspects. On any showing, however, something had to start the investigative ball rolling. Turning to the offences which may or could be committed by journalists in pursuit of a story, the target of the story is unlikely to be aware that he or she is or has been the victim of crime. A story in the press will be assumed to have emanated from a relative or a friend aware of the details. And even if, as now, there is a suspicion that something more is involved that a phone message has been intercepted or an email hacked, there'll be no evidence that this has been the case. A complaint to the police will be unlikely. And even if the victim takes the suspicion to the police on a one-off basis and in the absence of special circumstances, it's equally unlikely that it will be considered operationally proportionate to deploy the highly specialised and expensive expertise necessary to investigate. Even assuming I'm wrong and a complaint is made which is investigated, it cannot be assumed that the investigation will reveal what has been going on to expose all such criminal wrongdoing. In the two operations examined in great detail in my report, what was significant was not merely the limited original complaint and the reasons for the investigation. In both cases, what happened was the authorities were led to a private detective who they suspected of crime, breach of data protection in one case, phone hacking in the other. When search warrants were executed, however, the authorities discovered a mountain of information, a true 
treasure trove in the form of records which had been kept. In relation to the data protection case, there were books recording what information had been sought by which papers and prima facie evidence of many offences having been committed. In relation to the phone hacking case, 11,000 pieces of paper were recovered with details of thousands of individuals, including in many cases their mobile numbers and their PINs, that could be used to access messages. Without those records, nobody would have been any the wiser as to the extent of what had been going on. Nobody would have been any the wiser. And it would be surprising indeed if these were the only people in the country doing this sort of thing. In other words, absent evidence to point to the commission of an offence, which requires rather more than mere assertion before any report, let alone investigation, can be considered justifiable, nobody who's been the subject of intrusion will necessarily be aware of the circumstances in which information about them came to enter the public domain. At its highest will be a concern that someone has provided information to a journalist which has then been published. But any attempt to identify from whom or how that material was obtained will fail on the basis that no journalist will reveal a source. In this regard, it's only right to acknowledge that the law very properly affords journalists a great deal of respect in order to protect very important rights of freedom of expression and a free press. Important not least to ensure that the press is able to carry out its entirely legitimate responsibility of telling truth to power and holding power to account. Seeking to go behind these principles raises important questions and means that the police will only do so in the most compelling of circumstances. Other issues also arise, such as the extent to which the police can expend resources on investigations. Police resources, certainly in the United Kingdom, and I anticipate in Australia as well, are not limitless. Priorities have to be set. It's therefore inevitable that a decision will have to be taken at an early stage whether the public interest sufficiently requires resources for this type of investigation, perhaps at the expense of investigating other criminal activity or undertaking other types of police work. Even where a decision to investigate is taken and is then properly carried out, it will then be a matter for discretion whether to prosecute. That's a point made clear in the UK as long ago as 1951 by the then Attorney General Sir Hartley Shawcross QC, who in a statement to the House of Commons said, quotes, it has never been the rule in this country, I hope it never will be, that suspected criminal offences must automatically be the subject of prosecution. Both the UK and, the, and Australia provide for the present manifestation of this discretion within the Code for Crown Prosecutors and the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth, respectively, which not only prescribes an evidential test whether there's sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction against each suspect on each charge, but also a public interest test. Let me cite that in England and Wales. It's articulated in this way. A prosecution will usually take place unless the prosecutor is sure that there are public interest factors tending against prosecution which outweigh those tending in favour, or unless the prosecutor is satisfied that the public interest may properly be served in the first instance by offering the offender the opportunity to have the matter dealt with by an out-of-court disposal. The more serious the offence or the offender's record of criminal behaviour, the more likely it is that a prosecution will be required in the public interest. Assessing the public interest is not simply a matter of adding up the number of factors on each side and seeing which side has the greater number. Each case must be considered on its own facts and on its own merits. Prosecutors must decide the importance of each public interest factor in the circumstances of each case and go on to make an overall assessment. It's quite possible that one factor alone 
might outweigh a number of other factors which tend in the opposite direction. Although there may be public interest factors tending against prosecution in a particular case, prosecutors should consider whether, nonetheless, a prosecution should go ahead and for those factors to be put to the court for consideration when sentence is passed. This raises a number of considerations. First, it should be clear that the successful investigation of alleged criminality depends on a number of factors. Most significant of those in this context is that it may well be the case, as it was in respect of phone hacking in the UK, that the victims of the alleged criminal behaviour were unaware of the fact that offences might have been committed. Secondly, the growth of the internet and the amount of private information that we place upon it increases potential avenues for criminal access to private information. Again, as with phone hacking, potential victims are unlikely to be aware of such action. Remote access to private information is likely to become an increasing risk as more and ever more information is stored in that way. We're also well aware that the scope of unlawful access to that information is not limited by physical boundaries. Hackers do not have to be in the same country as the computers they are hacking. This raises a question for investigation and enforcement of the criminal law. How are we to carry it out effectively in those circumstances? Are we going to have to give greater thought than we have at present to cross-border engagement, investigation and enforcement? If the information is obtained from a hacker based in a foreign jurisdiction, how are we to deal with that effectively? Considerations and questions multiply. If the criminal law is to remain an effective backstop, are we going to have to follow Mansfield rather than Blackstone? It seems to me that it is more than probable that we will reflect the approach of Mansfield. We will have to look at how the professional media and the amateurs work in practice. What does not seem to be an option, however, is simply to assume that we will, without further consideration, take the same past historical approach to the criminal law, to investigation and to enforcement. If the issues which arise at present are not to become all the more significant in the future, we're likely to have to give our approach considered thought. The answer is likely to involve closer cooperation, specifically to deal with what are, after all, global or supranational problems. So the legal background in a civil law context. If the growth of the internet is posing questions for the criminal law, it's equally doing so for the civil law. The development of a more internet-based professional media is likely to raise further questions. What are the questions? The first concerns enforcement of the civil law, whether it be the law of defamation, of misuse of private information, or more generally of privacy, a topic I understand very hotly being debated in Australia at the moment. It's sometimes suggested that the growth of the internet has made effective enforcement of the civil law more difficult, if not impossible. Some have suggested the internet is like the Wild West, and one without an effective sheriff or a Wyatt Earp to ride into town. There have, of course, been a number of well-known examples where a seemingly lawless approach has been taken by internet users. Possibly the most well-known or widely reported occurred during the early part of 2011. I refer to what was described in the English press as super-injunction spring. As you probably know, the term super-injunction was coined by Alan Rusbridge of the editor of the Guardian newspaper. It describes an interim injunction granted in privacy proceedings and which enjoins the disclosure of both the substantive content of the injunction and indeed the very fact of the injunction. The injunctions were, generally speaking, obtained by celebrities in order to stop the public disclosure of information concerning their private lives. They are often obtained against persons unknown but also served on newspapers which would be bound by the terms of the injunction. Because the respondents to the injunction were generally unknown, and because the injunction would only bind third parties, that is the news media, while it was in force as an interim injunction, there was a tendency on the part of claimants 
not to pursue their claims beyond the interim stage. The super injunction became, in effect, a final injunction. It subsequently became apparent that the actual number of such injunctions was not as great as supposed at the time, not least because a large number of interim injunctions, which simply anonymised the name of the parties, were wrongly described as super injunctions, and hence gave the rise to the impression there were more of them than was likely to be in the case. At the time, though, in an atmosphere which believed that such injunctions were rife and the media were chafing at being the subject to them as they restricted their ability to print stories, the internet was very different. Vast numbers of individuals, many anonymously, were blogging and tweeting names of individuals who, it was said, had obtained the injunctions, as well as the reasons why they believed the individuals had obtained them. Rumour upon rumour swirled around. It was no doubt the case that, as with any rumour, many were unfounded and no doubt defamed innocent individuals. Equally, it was no doubt the case that a number of the names circulating had obtained the injunctions and ought, therefore, to have had the benefit of the law's protection. This situation clearly exacerbated the media's concerns. They were the subject to injunctions and were liable to the force of the law if they breached them. They had, however, to watch the very same injunctions being breached with apparent impunity by many thousands on the internet. It's understandable why celebrities might not want to take enforcement action against those blogging their names in breach of injunctions. To do so would arguably be a time-consuming and expensive affair. In some cases, it might be difficult to track down the individuals. But more importantly, perhaps, it would simply have added to what has become known as the Barbara Streisand effect. That is, further attempts to stop the publication of the information on the internet just simply inflame the situation and lead to even greater dissemination. This example highlights an important difference between, on the one hand, those bloggers and tweeters who've no real reputation for accuracy or reliability, but are, in many ways, no more than electronic versions of pub gossip. And on the other hand, the established media and established journalists who have a powerful reputation for accuracy and, in the overwhelming majority of cases, for acting within the law and the internet. The established media conforms to the law, and when they do not, they remain potentially liable to the law. Where the established media has a web-based publication, an online edition, it is susceptible, for instance, to take down notices. Equally, it's liable to pay damages in appropriate cases and has an appropriately deep pocket to do so. The writ of the law runs against them. In the super injunction example, the writ of the law was perhaps believed not to run against bloggers and tweeters. This is perhaps an example of the wider phenomenon I mentioned earlier, the belief that the law does not and cannot apply to the internet. In many ways, this is a pernicious and false belief. False because the law can be enforced against those who blog and tweet. Pernicious because the idea that the law does not apply to some while it applies to others undermines the rule of law as it is inconsistent with the idea of equality before the law. Procedural justice requires the law to be equally applicable to all. What does it mean if this issue is not resolved to ensure that the law is equally applicable against both bloggers and tweeters as well as against the established media as far as news gathering is concerned. First, it has a potential effect on media culture, on journalistic culture. If the media in general, and journalists in particular, see the law going unenforced against those who blog and tweet, might this undermine media standards through encouraging to adopt them to adopt a casual approach to the law? Lawlessness in one area may affect other areas. It may then lead to a more generally casual approach to ethical news gathering by journalists, one which was less and less likely to approach that role within the boundaries set by the civil and the criminal law. 
This effect may not be a direct one, in that it might not lead journalists to run stories online in breach of injunctions. I'll return to this in a moment. Rather, it might lead to journalists adopting an approach which was less than scrupulous in the pursuit of stories. In order to steal a march on bloggers and tweeters, they might be tempted to cut corners, to break or at least bend the law to obtain information for stories or to infringe privacy improperly to the same end. It may encourage unethical and potentially unlawful practices to get a story. The effect, then, is an indirect one, and one which lies behind the headline and the front-page scoop. In a culture which sees some act with impunity in the face of the civil law and the criminal law, a general decline in standards may arise. Secondly, as I alluded to a moment ago, it might have a direct effect. It might lead the established media to attempt to compete with bloggers in the provision of information to the public in breach of injunctions. Such a situation could particularly arise in those circumstances where an established newspaper to move entirely online and perhaps move its base outside the jurisdiction in which it targets its publication. It seems to me that this risk is one which at present, and for the medium term at least, is unlikely to arise. This is the case due to the role which the established media plays in society. If they were to be seen and understood to be regularly acting in breach of the law, they would start to lose their authoritative voice. If they lost that voice, they'd simply be one more online purveyor of gossip with the attendant loss of influence which that would entail. Equally, where the established media is concerned, the ability to enforce judgments, whether by way of damages or via contempt of court, will retain its potency and is more than likely to do so, even in an entirely online age. This is not to suggest complacency. As with the criminal law, issues are likely to arise in respect of the enforcement of the civil law. Those issues are likely to arise from different approaches to freedom of expression across the world, different approaches which may make it difficult to enforce judgments from one state to another, from one country to another. This may well require us all to consider the best approach to such issues if we are to maintain comity among states and establish cross-border recognition and enforcement of judgments against common standards. Again, it may require us to reconsider the approaches we've taken in the past to develop a cosmopolitan approach and one which supports the rule of law through a fair and effective international framework. It might be said that if we facilitate or condone breaches of the law and thereby weaken the rule of law by failing to act and to recognise judgments and orders which emanate from other countries, we encourage the weakening of the rule of law at home as well. In other words, in respect of the civil law also, we may have to adopt Mansfield's approach. So, a conclusion. Where does this leave us? There's no doubt that the mainstream professional media is in the process of evolving. That is, moving towards a business model based around the internet. It's also likely that in the not-too-distant future, a large percentage, if, if not the majority, of the print media will be entirely online. That it will no longer be a print media, or dead trees, as sometimes talk about, people talk about newspapers. The question for us is how to ensure that the criminal and civil legal framework, which in the main provides the framework within which the mainstream media operate, is able to continue to play that role in the future. It seems to me that while this raises important and challenging issues, they are not insurmountable. If we are to ensure that appropriate standards are maintained, we must meet those challenges and ensure that the media not only remains subject to the law, but that it is not placed at a disadvantage where the enforcement of the law is concerned. We will therefore have to think creatively about how we ensure that the law is capable of equal application and is applied equally and fairly against the mainstream media and bloggers, tweeters and other online amateur journalists. In short, if we're to ensure that we have the media we deserve, we're going to have to be more Mansfield than Blackstone. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Lord Justice Leveson. Um, my name is Margaret Simons. I'm director of the Centre for Advanced Journalism. Um, Lord Justice Leveson has kindly agreed to take a few questions. Um, a couple of points. As he has already said, he won't be answering questions on his report or its recommendations or indeed the reception of the report. Um, it's my job to chair the questions. Um, I would remind you that uh, this session is being recorded, so please keep that in mind, and also wait for the microphone to reach you before you start your questions. I am also aware we have members of the working media here as well as members of the public. I'm going to be trying to balance uh, people's opportunity to ask a question, so I would ask you to identify yourself um, when you ask a question. So do we have any questions? Not a single one. <laughs> yes, there's one here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for your excellent uh, talk. Uh, would, you, really... would you mind identifying yourself, please? Oh, yes. Uh, mm. All right. Uh, not a journalist. Uh, my name is Andy Kitchen. I'm a student at RMIT, in fact. Um, it was an uh, excellent and elucidating talk. Um, one comment was, I think, perhaps cracker would be a preferred term, because one cracks a computer as they crack a safe, but one does not hack a computer, so to speak, to generally. Question, please, oh, yes, thank you. Generally, hacking would be uh, a more of an action which could be either positive or negative, whereas cracking almost always negative. Um, I think that something that comes up a lot in terms of journalism online is whether how rights and responsibilities are balanced. For example, I think that the responsibility, for Could you example, please bring it to a question, sir, rather than a speech? Just ask a question. Uh, yeah. Certainly. Mm. My question then, rephrased as a question, is how does one balance the rights and responsibilities of an informal, infrequent journalist as opposed to a large, established journalistic organisation? Well... The right of free speech is a right of every single one of us. Journalists merely exercise that right in the course of their of making a living. So all of us have the right to speak within the law, and we're all subject to the same law. The reason why we have to be particularly careful about those who practice journalism is because of the greater power that they hold. They have an enormous megaphone which reaches a very wide audience. Whereas if you and I speak exercising our right of free speech, it's unlikely that the microphone will pick us up. And therefore, there is less potential harm to the community by what we say to each other. There is a risk of harm from those who do have a powerful megaphone, and I believe that with that uh, megaphone comes additional responsibilities. Okay, another question. We have one right up the back there. Again, would you please identify yourself? Hello, uh, Duncan Kennedy from the BBC. Um, <laughs> You're 12,000 miles away from home. <laughs> I live in Sydney, actually. Welcome to Melbourne. <laughs> in terms of uh, journalism, the law, privacy and broadcasting, are there any lessons to be learned from this week's tragic story of the London nurse and the Sydney radio station? I am absolutely sure there are a large number of lessons to be learned. But you will forgive me if, as I understand it, the police in London are investigating this and there's an inquest ongoing, and I still remain a judge in England and Wales and might be called upon to decide something in the future. So uh, I'm sure there are lessons to be learned, but I'm not going to discuss them. <laughs> Uh, we have another question here. Um, yep. Hi, my name is Veronica.
Bianca Fitzgerald, and I'm a student here at the University of Melbourne. I'm just interested in your views on how the law, the criminal and the civil, intersects with the ethics of children bloggers, y young people, I don't know, like under 18 or whatever the law considers a child in whatever jurisdiction. So I'm just interested in young people now as they're on the internet. Uh, and how the law sees that interaction. I think this is one of the great challenges uh, that we all face. I am very concerned that our children are much more adept at using computers than, well, I can't speak for you, but I can certainly speak for myself, and are less conscious of the risks that they're taking. It may be great fun to upload a funny photograph onto Facebook, but they don't appreciate that that photograph leaves a digital fingerprint which is there effectively forever. I commented um, uh, last week that uh, there is no rehabilitation via Google. There is no um, time when all these photographs come down. And therefore, there is an enormous educative exercise for all of us in relation to the way in which the Internet is used. And I'm not sure that there haven't got to be additional rules or laws, I'm not being prescriptive here, as to how the internet is used. It's horrifying the extent to which pornography and racist material can be accessed on the internet. And I think these are issues which do indeed require to be addressed. Another question. We have one in the second front row here. Thank you. My name is Meredith Doig. Um, I'm variously a member of uh, the higher education community. There is a principle of freedom of speech, but that does not mean license. It, there are limits. Presumably one of the limits is the, pr the protection from harm, but that raises the question about how do you define harm. Would you like to comment on the definition of harm and particularly in the context of is it harm as somebody experiences harm or is it harm if somebody intends harm. For example, uh, about um, if, if somebody uh, says that they are offended, is that harm? Is one person's offence just merely somebody else's light-hearted joke? Well, uh, if I convert that into legal terms, I'd talk about the difference between the subjective and an objective consideration of the facts. And free speech is just that. It's subject to the law, and uh, the famous example, which is not free speech, is crying fire in a cinema. Uh, that's not protected speech. Uh, my own view is that you will have to assess that against the, norm the normative values of your society. So, for example, in the UK, effectively we have developed a privacy law. Um, then there will have to be a judgment as to whether a particular conduct or speech offends that law. Now, in the first blush, it would have to offend it subjectively. Obviously, if the subject of the speech did not complain or, or mind about it, no issue arises. But on, the, on top of the subjective appreciation, there has to be an objective analysis as well. And that's where judges come in. They are the so-called reasonable man or woman on the Clapham omnibus. Um, I don't know where, which omnibus 
uh, we'd, we'd choose in Australia. But, <laughs> yes. but the idea is that the common law has this wonderful idea of the reasonable man, a very boring individual, I think, but um, that's how we judge many of the assessments that, as judges, we make. We have a question there. It's the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, thank you. My name's Ben Peake. I'm a Melbourne housewife. Now, you talked a bit about the international cooperation, transnational crime. How are you going to get agreement when there are considerable cultural differences between uh, different cultures on what privacy means? I'm thinking partially of the topless photos of the Duchess of Cambridge, or going a bit further back, uh, the libel action that uh, Melbournean Joseph Gutnick uh, had against the Wall Street Journal, which was heard in Melbourne. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the ability well, to sort of harmonise and uh, standardise cooperation on these matters? I can't comment on the latter at all. In relation to the former, there is um, a little section in a document I've recently published that, that discusses that. Uh, no, but um, I think that is the $64,000 question. Uh, and I recognise that different people will have different standards. It's particularly difficult when one comes to try to play in the approach to these issues in the United States. Um, but solve it as an international community, I believe is necessary, if not essential, if we are going to bring some order. Now, of course, some people may think the whole point about the internet is there is no order. And uh, I, I understand the point. But we have throughout to balance all the rights and responsibilities that we as a society owe to individuals and individuals owe to a society. And that's the exercise that we have to undertake. Uh, but uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have a, um, a magic solution. Uh, uh, but, but that we need to work towards one, perhaps at a base level. I mean, everybody would agree, I hope, that we should do something about the terrible obscenity that can be found on the internet. Um, and that might be a start. How far you go will depend upon the discussion at the time. But I hope that it's happening. Question there in the middle of the... My name's Deborah Stone. I'm a journalist who's moved from the print media to working online now for a niche publication. And I want to, you, to ask you to address the question of racial vilification and the capacity of the law to deal with that issue online. Well, there are offences in the UK that deal with... Um, incitement to racial hatred and there is no reason why the, that writ shouldn't be run against anybody who publishes online in the UK. Indeed, there have been prosecutions of bloggers and tweeters in the United Kingdom for what they've published. Uh, and I see no difference from prosecuting in those circumstances than prosecuting in any other circumstances. The problem becomes the supranational one to which you were just referring. And uh, my aunt, I refer to my previous answer. Okay, um, the gentleman here. No, sorry, the gentleman behind you, Edmund, I'm sorry. <coughs> just here. Uh, can you put your hand up again, sir, so that the microphone can find you? No, this gentleman here in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Fitt. Uh, 
I'll call myself a, a citizen, perhaps a senior citizen. Uh, I'd like to refer to um, the megaphone you mentioned before and to the issue of freedom of speech. I guess my question is, what can be done about a blogger, a very powerful one, a very influential one, that runs an openly massive campaigns? In this country, for example, uh, one major news outlet has run campaigns, open campaigns, against the issue of climate change, for example, and against the current federal government, I think legally, but the question I'm concerned about is the effect of such campaigns in a democracy such as ours and what can be done about that, if anything. Well, uh, I'm slightly cautious about entering what looks to me like a bit of a minefield. <laughs> uh, one of the areas that was the subject of concern in the inquiry was, was what was described as bad science. An example that was given concerned the MMR scare, um, which led to many children not receiving an important um, treatment at very early on in their lives and an increase, therefore, of the diseases that had effectively been eradicated. And I would hope that all responsible journals with a megaphone would be conscious of the need to exercise care when um, promoting campaigns to ensure that the basis for the campaigns was sufficiently identified. And one of the ways of doing that is to require an identification of the sources for statistics, for material, to be published so that people can do so. That's a wonderful thing about the internet because you can put in a hyperlink and then go and look at the material yourself. Um, and uh, that's a way of trying to ensure that responsibility is exercised. But uh, how much further one can go is very difficult. I, I, I take the problem, but uh, I think it, 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 is, it has issues surrounding it, which I'm pleased to say I mentioned in the report, so I don't need to go further into it. <laughs> uh, we have time for perhaps two more questions. There's one right up the back there. My name is Pat Caruana. I'm a journalist with Australian Associated Press. Uh, I was hoping to ask you about, uh, or if you had any comments about the effectiveness of, of self-regulation in the Australian media, and if we are to move to a model of tighter regulation, perhaps with the backing of government, should it apply to bloggers uh, as, as well as to mainstream publications? I, I congratulate <coughs> you on the question, and you're absolutely entitled to ask it in the same way that I'm absolutely going to decline to answer it. <laughs> As I think you probably appreciated would be the case. <laughs> OK, one more question. Oh, dear, there's a forest of hands. Um, I'm going to choose the lady there in the, um, uh, the pink top. Hi, my name is Casey. I'm a student at the University of Melbourne. I just had a question in relation to rights and responsibilities of publishing online. If you had any comment relating to the legal precedents that are now being set with platforms such as Twitter being held accountable for what people are writing on their platform rather than the, the, pub, the person who's written the comment themselves? Uh, I'm, I, if I've understood the question, you're asking about the accountability of those who make the, the who tweet rather than the accountability of the company that operates Twitter, is that right? Yes, and the, and the yes. legal precedents that are recently being well, there, set. Well, there's absolutely no doubt about this. Um, if you tweet defamatory material, 
you are liable in defamation. And indeed, uh, there is an example in the UK at the moment where um, a prominent politician was named on um, Twitter as having been responsible for um, sexual offending, quite wrongly. Uh, uh, there were apologies have been uttered, and as I understand it, that politician is pursuing those who tweeted and retweeted his name. And uh, I won't comment on the prospect of that litigation because, again, it might come in front of me. But there's no reason why... Um, if I write something defamatory, I'm liable. If I speak something defamatory that, is, uh, that satisfies certain criteria, because libel is different from slander, then I'm liable. What difference if I type it into a, into a tweet or a blog or, a, or an online comment? We are out of time, I'm afraid. In fact, we, ha we have gone over time. Um, Lord Justice Levinson, I would like to thank you for a very stimulating address. We are living through an era of technological change which will alter every state of society, including the fourth estate, but not only the fourth estate. And I think you've laid out the issues with the clarity and quality of analysis, which is rarely seen. I'd also like to thank very much the uh, staff of the Centre for Advanced Journalism, without which tonight would not happen. Lucy Chancellor Wheel, most of all, up the back there. Uh, Louise Wilson and Fiona Sanna, thank you very much for all your work in organising this. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight and taking part in what I hope you've found to be an interesting discussion. Good night.